commute. <laughs> so we are an emerging professional organization for therapists as well as professional colleagues within the medical and healthcare field. We promote and support local opportunities, resources, and events that strengthen the mental health field and even the wellness of therapists because we know that you are truly also essential workers and on the front line supporting families and individuals throughout their life experiences. We want to make sure that you feel supported. So we welcome students and interns. We welcome licensed therapists. You can have a background in substance abuse prevention, clinical social work, mental health, and of course, marriage and family therapy. Uh, some of the fields are shifting to couples and family therapy. So we welcome all of you and we hope to get to know you better, meet your needs and network. So thank you all for being here and I will turn it over to Eric. Okay, I'm not ready. Okay. <laughs> no, so unfortunately, worries. everybody, what happened is when I sent out this, we've never done this before, this is the first time I've ever used Eventbrite. And what I thought was going to happen is when you guys signed up, you were automatically going to get the link for the training today. And I realized that that didn't happen. So now I'm actually uh, emailing everybody who signed up one by one, because I don't know a better way to do it. Uh, so that we can get this training started. So I apologize for that. I think I'm finished and I am great. So that worked out well. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Eric Munt. I am an LMFT. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, I'm also the president of the Florida Family Therapy Association. Uh, I believe I'm the president for both the state of Florida and our Palm Beach County chapter, since that's where we are located. Uh, like I like I said, I'm an LMFT. I'm a registered play therapist. I'm a play therapy supervisor. And I'm also a, a training provider for the Association for Play Therapy. So this training is a non-contact hour training today. Uh, in order to get contact hours uh, over the internet for play therapy, each training must be at least two hours. And so because this is going to be a one hour training today, it's, it's going to be a non-contact hour training, but it's free. So, you know, my motto, if it's free, it's for me. I'll take at least three. So, um, so anyway, so what we're going to do today is we have a limited amount of time. Uh, basically, I have taken a four hour training and attempted to condense it into one hour. So um, we're going to do the best that we can. I am going to stay on longer for anyone who has questions uh, as we go through this. And uh, my goal for today is to have this not be boring. So if I can do that, then I've accomplished my goal. So the first thing I'm going to do um, oh, uh, Sophia, I need you to turn control back over to me, please, if you can, so I can okay. share my screen. Oops. And like I said, everybody, this is the first time we're doing one of these trainings for everyone. So thank you all for being here. There probably will be some bumps in the road. So as that happens, I certainly apologize. There you go. All right. But we're going to get this going. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I kind of want to do um, is for anybody who's never uh, you know, understood about how to become a registered play therapist or to be a play therapist, I really wanted to kind of go over uh, the guidelines to becoming a registered play therapist first, because I think this is really important. Um, and the Association for Play Therapy recently changed these guidelines. And so initially when I saw these guidelines, they were super confusing. And then I had a meeting with the APT and they kind of explained it to me. So I'm going to do my best to explain it to all of you uh, as, as, as well as I can. So in order to become a, hundred, um, a registered play therapist, you must have 150 hours of training. A hundred of those hours have to be contact hours and the other 50 have to be non-contact hours. And as you can see by my screen, there are several different domains that you have to get your contact hours in. Um, so the history of play therapy, uh, play therapy seminal or historically significant theories. So we're gonna get into uh, client-centered play therapy today. So if, um, we're gonna get into a little bit of the theory of that. We're also gonna talk about play therapy skills and methods. So you're gonna be able to take this one hour and put it under three of this, potentially three of these different domains, depending on where you are in getting all of your hours. Uh, there are play therapy special topics and their applicant's choice. And as you can see, there's a minimum number of hours required. 
and then there's phase one, phase two, and phase three. So that looked really confusing to me. So the idea behind this is for every number of hours of training you get, you're supposed to be doing play therapy face-to-face -face with children at the same time. So you're actually doing the training while you're seeing children. And the idea behind this is, is that it didn't really make sense to APT to either see all the kids and then do all the training or do all the training and then see kids. They wanted it to coincide. So this idea is there's phase one, phase two, and phase three. So you're getting a percentage of these hours while you're seeing a percentage of the number of client contact hours you need to move from one phase to the other. Now, the Association for Play Therapy is not super strict on this, but they do wanna make sure that your supervisor is signing off, um, that there is different phases. That being said, you have to have 500 hours of client contact play therapy uh, in order to complete and become a registered play therapist. So, um, so anyway, so this is just a brief idea. So basically like, for phase one, right, you want to have as many as 20 to 30 hours of training in seminal theories, 10 to 20 hours in uh, play therapy skills and methods, and zero to five hours of training in play therapy and special topics while you're doing a third of 500 hours of client contact therapy, right? So in your first phase, you've done 35 to 55 hours of training, and you've gotten one third of 500 hours of client contact. Then you move to phase two and then you move to phase three. So, and again, realistically, the Association for Play Therapy is very flexible. You guys can uh, set this up in a way that your training, one person may take this training today and put it under play therapy history, and another person taking this training today may put it under uh, skills and methods, and that's totally fine. OK, so again, the APT is not looking to stop anyone from becoming a registered play therapist. They just kind of wanted to have guidelines in place to help all of you understand what they're looking for as you go through your training. Now, I know this is probably complicated. I'll take some questions on this at the end, but I did just kind of want to go over this with everyone before we get started so that we're kind of clear on where this is going. So what we're going to be focusing on today, and this is the primary model that I work in, is what's called client-centered play therapy. And um, it's, it's basically a non-directive form of play therapy. Let me see if I can switch this. There we go. It's a non-directive form of play therapy where we're simply facilitating the child uh, in creating a space for them to grow and explore. And so most, if not all of my play therapy training has really been in this, this type. And I find it to be very effective. Um, I've been doing this type of play therapy for about 20 years now, which makes me crazy. I'll tell you an interesting story. I worked with a two-year-old doing this model of therapy about 18, no, about, yeah, about 18 years ago. And the mom just emailed me that he graduated from high school last week. She invited me to his... Uh, um, what do they call it when you get their, your diploma? I forget what that's called. Uh, the graduation ceremony. So, and I've had several different situations where I worked with a child at seven years old and now they're 23 or 24 and they actually come back and see me as an adult and want to process some of these therapy sessions. So that's really interesting and something I never could have even thought about when I first started doing this work 20 years ago but it has a long-term effect on children and they remember how this therapy affects them. So we're gonna talk about the basic tenets of play therapy and we're gonna talk about the specific skills in this type of play therapy. So hopefully you'll have a general idea for how to go out and do some of this work uh, at the end of the training today. So, what play, so play therapy is really affective, behavioral, cognitive, integrated therapy. And it allows for a narrative of the trauma or problem through the child's own language of symbolic play in the safety of the playroom. And so there's, there's two things there, right? The language of the child and safety, all right? And those are the two basic tenets of play therapy. I have this conversation with parents a lot. The way children deal with their world and the language that they work in is through play. And so I, I talk to a lot of parents that they think that I'm a magician and they're going to bring their four-year-old and he's going to talk to me about all his feelings for 45 minutes. And that just doesn't work, right? So, but I can play with him and he can create symbolic play and I can enter his world and I can reflect feelings and I can help him process whatever his stuff is, okay? 
It allows the therapist to enter the child's world and observe as the child directs the pace and content of therapy in his own time and language, right? So in this model, the child is directing the therapy. We are there to observe and be a part of, and we're leaving it on the child's own terms to do so. So each session is designed to build the therapeutic relationship through the child's language of play in a free and protected environment using reflective listening, encouragement, positive limit setting, and problem solving to address and process a multitude of emotional issues. So what is play therapy, right? How do we create a, a therapeutic relationship with children? We do it through acceptance. We do it through non-judgment. We do it through building trust. We build it through following the child's needs, um, following the child's lead, and we do it through acknowledging feelings. And I always say to myself, and I get choked up a little bit, but it's the Mr. Rogers model. You are special just the way you are, okay? And that's where we're meeting the child in the beginning of the therapy is from that skill set. You are um, special and perfect just the way that you are. from my school. Um, can everybody please make sure that school. they have that they're muted because there's somebody yelling in the background. Thank you. Uh, so how do you let someone know that you are listening without saying anything or asking questions? How do you do that? So play therapy is child directed, right? We're focusing on the person rather than the problem. Parents come in a lot. My child has the problem. That's not our focus. Our focus is on the person. We're dealing with the present rather than the past. We're dealing with feelings rather than thoughts or acts, right? So I'm an MFT, right? All of my MFT training in graduate school, feelings were the F word. We're not supposed to talk about them. We're only supposed to look at systemic theory and systemic process and behavior. Play therapy is the opposite. All we're focusing on with kids is feelings. We're working on understanding rather than explaining. We're working on accepting rather than correcting. We're following the child's direction rather than the therapist's instruction. And we're following the child's wisdom. We are starting from the standpoint that the child has internal wisdom rather than what our knowledge is as the therapist. So what are the objectives for the child, right? What are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to develop a more positive self-concept. We're helping the child resume, assume greater self-responsibility. We want the child to become more self-directing, self-accepting, self-reliant, self-determined in decision-making, experiencing a feeling of control, okay? Most children, there's lots of things happening in their world that they feel like they have no control over. And a lot of their behavior is grasping for control. This is a safe space where they're in control. That by itself is therapeutic more often than not. We become sensitive to the process of coping. We help them to develop an internal source of evaluation, and we help them to become more trusting of themselves. So goals and expectations can impede therapy, right? And a lot of parents have goals and expectations about how they want you to fix their kid, right? And so focusing on just the behavior or the problem and missing the underlying cause can impede the therapy. Interference with the therapeutic relationship, making it difficult to see the world through the child's eyes. One of the biggest mistakes that therapists make with children is we're trying to bring children into our world instead of attempting to enter theirs. And in order to really work with and help a child, we have to work on seeing the world through their eyes. We get lots of pressure from parents and teachers saying, fix him. And there are treatment plans versus play therapy and they don't always uh, connect with each other. And when nothing seems to be working, this is where play therapy can also come in. So what are some of the basic tenets of doing some of this work? So play is to the child, right? What verbal communication is to the adults. Hence, it is the most effective vehicle through which adults can understand and guide children. Okay, and we have a little cartoon here. I'm going to keep flying through, unfortunately, because we only have an hour. So I want to cover a lot of stuff in a short time. So play therapy offers children the opportunity to learn about their world, understand how things work, express their feelings, master new physical skills, discover new mental skills, learn to bond with others, and they learn social skills, right? We do a lot of play therapy groups as well. Of, of groups of three to four children to help work on social skills. 
Let's see what happened here. Oh. And then we have four areas of development, physical growth, emotional growth, cognitive growth, and social growth. So, you know, play is under siege and has been for quite some time. Almost one third, 30% of third grade children have minimal or no recess, right? And what's the big punishment everybody does now is silent lunch. So the only time kids are allowed to socialize would be lunchtime and because their, their punishment is to eat it silently and they can't talk. Uh, disadvantaged people, so low income, black or Hispanic children are likely to be denied, denied recess altogether. Um, play is being, oops, sorry, play is being eliminated in kindergarten. Play is being replaced in preschools with lessons targeting cognitive development and the contents of standardized tests. Um, and that's shifted a little bit over time. You know, now we're seeing that in a lot of preschools, there's a lot more play involved. At circle time, it's really about 30 minutes. And then the rest of the day is typically play. Instead of interactive creative play, you know, three-year-old children are being asked to sit at tables and learn skills that are for children two years older. And this still happens. So what is the empirical research about this, right? There's cognitive development. Play is beneficial for developing language skills and problem solving and perspective taking and representational skills and memory and creativity and, and contributes to early literacy development. Uh, it works on social development. Play contributes to social skills such as turn taking, collaboration, following rules, empathy, self-regulation, impulse control, and motivation. And studies have also found the positive effects of play on children's physical development, such as muscle development, coordination, and obesity prevention, right? So we're trying to focus on the whole child when we're doing this work. So what are some developmental skills that are learned in play therapy, right? Mastery, learning skills that are needed as an adult, discovering what is pretend or what is real, creativity, making something out of nothing, imagination and creativity spark new ideas and ways of seeing something. And this is a big one because the more that kids are exposed to electronics and iPads and stuff, the less creative they, they are becoming. And it's very concerning to me that we're seeing that. We want our children to be creative. We want them to make something out of nothing. And we want to work on problem solving, figuring out how things work, resolving conflicts with others, learning to negotiate. Uh, we're working on social skills, learning who their peers are, how to interact with them, practicing different ways of connecting with them. Uh, we're bonding with adults and peers. We're learning empathy, trust. And if there's not a good family environment, learning how a safe, caring environment can feel. We're learning to identify and express feelings. And this is a big one. You know, we assume that just because a three-year-old has learned to speak, that they know what to do with the language. And they don't. And so a lot of this work is helping children, especially ages three to five, learn to identify and verbalize and express their feelings in a better way. So what are some play therapy interventions, right? This is why everybody's here today. So the first thing we're doing is structure. Structure is super important. It sets the stage <clears throat> and containment for the session. This is your special time, or now is your time to do most anything you like, not anything, most anything you like. If there's anything you may not do, I will let you know. That's it. Why don't we start with names? My name is Mr. Eric, and then I wait, and the child will typically tell me their name. Limits need to be set only when necessary. We're not looking for problems before they happen. We're simply being with the child, and when a limit needs to be set, we set it. At the end of the session, we're giving a five minute warning. We have five minutes left to play. We have one minute left to play. Why? We're helping the child to prepare. We're creating a space where at the beginning and end of the session, it's always the same. Why? Because it makes the child feel safe. It helps them let them know what to expect. <clears throat> so what are some feelings expressed by young children? This is a great quote. Feelings are the ground out of which caring grows. For some children, the starting point in developing conscience is helping the child to feel. Some children are overwhelmed by their feelings because they do not understand them and cannot put them into words. They need help to learn to identify, understand, and act constructively on their feelings. All right, so... We're working on the therapeutic relationship, right? We're working on congruence, a realness or genuineness and consistency between thoughts, feelings, and behavior. We're making sure ourselves in relation to the children is consistent and congruent. 
right? There's lots of live, um, different levels of communication. How often are the words that come out of your mouth, the tone that you use, the facial expression that you make, and the body language not congruent? That is confusing for a child. So we are making all of us congruent to the child. We're coming from a place of acceptance, right? Unconditional positive regard, apprising or trust of the other person, an empathic understanding, the ability to appreciate and connect with another individual's feelings and experience. So how are we doing this? We're accepting the child as he or she is. We're seeing the child as a whole person. And we're working to understand what is driving the child's behaviors. We're developing an attitude of non-judgmental acceptance. We can only guess what another person is thinking. So we're watching, wait, and wondering, and then respond. When a child acts out, we're understanding that he is attempting to show us his most difficult feelings. This is how the child is trying to express his feelings. We have to do our best to understand that. We're seeing the child is doing the best that he or she can at a given time. So we're trying to see and connect with the positive. When they're acting out, this is the best that they're able to do in that moment. And we have to accept that and be there with them in that space while also helping them to show them a different way or a better way. So the child is our teacher. We're following the child's lead to understand how he views the world and copes with his problems. We're leaving personal issues at the playroom door. We're recognizing any counter transference. We're focusing on what is instead of what if or what was. We're being present and acknowledging current behavior. We're trying not to label the child. We believe that the child can break the bonds of current limitations. The child can change if we accept where the child is starting from. We have to believe that the child is able to learn, change, and wants to learn or change. Okay, so we're gonna to switch to my other PowerPoint. Hold on a minute. And then we're gonna get into some techniques. Does anyone have any questions so far? No? Okay. Well, I'm gonna switch PowerPoint, so just bear with me one second while I do that. Because the next PowerPoint, we're really gonna get into more of the techniques that we're working on. Okay, let's see if I can, I am not a technological master, so I apologize in advance. All right, can everybody see my screen? Good, okay, great, I'm doing great. So the number one tenet of, tenet of doing play therapy is reflective listening, okay? Everything that comes after comes from this. So if you leave with one technique today, it's how to make a good reflection with a child. If you can do this, it opens up a tremendous number of doors in terms of you connecting with the child, okay? Um, my eight-year-old calls me naming it. She says, Daddy, stop naming it. You always name it. I sound like one of your clients. I'm not. Just don't name it. Just play with me. So this is also called active or empathic listening. It allows the child to feel listened to and understood. It allows the therapist to understand the child's feelings, thoughts, and needs. Reflection and limit setting with reflection helps the child manage affective expression and regulate behavior. Ben, how are you? What happened here? Why is my? Yes. There we go. Okay. So reflective listening is hearing and observing the child and reflecting without judgment. Right. We're gonna. That's gonna keep coming back. Is this uh, this non-judgmental thing that we're trying to do? Patient form. Reflective listening is a tentative statement describing what you think the child may be trying to express in his or her words and actions, right? Okay. So it's tentative. Uh, we'll go through, is it possible for it to resend? Because I may have thought it was something I already submitted. Can so everybody can please uh, you, uh, yeah. mute your... If you, yeah, if please you mute. Sure I today. Please mute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, reflective listening enlarges the meaning of the behavior which fosters cognitive coping and processing by the child. Reflective listening helps the child to identify the feelings driving their behavior and find more appropriate ways to express those feelings. So everything starts from here. They're acting out because they have a feeling that they don't know how to verbalize and we're gonna help them do that, all right? So there are three interrelated basic concept, concepts, caring, 
We're suspending judgment. We're seeking the child's potential. Acceptance. We're not judging what is being expressed. We're using the words that reinforce the child's strengths. So we're starting where the client is. We are listening. We're reflecting the child's actions, patterns of behavior, and feelings. Now, this is the biggest one. We're going to turn questions into statements. We are not asking questions, right? We're all therapists. That's what we're good at is asking the right questions. In this model, we are not asking questions. We are taking that question and turn it into a statement. We're not saying, are you angry? Are you frustrated? We're saying, you seem frustrated. You seem angry. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more in, in a second because this is really important because by turning a question into a statement, you're actually affecting a different part of the child's brain. Okay. So children want to be heard, right? Feelings drive behavior. So a good reflection is tentative, right? It's a tentative statement. It's brief. It's in a few words. So your reflection should be seven to 10 words or less. You're matching the child's affect. So whatever face the child is making, you're making that same face too. Whatever tone the child is using, you're making that same tone too. That modeling, that matching of affect helps the child see where they are. We're acknowledging the child's wishes, wants, needs, and desires, but we are not necessarily fulfilling those wishes, wants, needs, or desires, okay? We're acknowledging them. We do not have to give in to them, okay? It's very, very important. We're just acknowledging. The relationship and the communication can now begin. The child has been heard, all right? Active listening statements, this is the basis for setting limits. And just by hitting the right reflection, it can often uh, avoid the child acting out. It can also allow the child to calm down and relax. Um, I remember when my daughter was like maybe two years old, my wife and I were trying to put her to bed one night and she was having trouble going to sleep. And I remember like ping pong, my wife and I were going back and forth with reflections. And my daughter was like, nope, 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 that's it. And then she would lay down and she went right to sleep. So sometimes a lot of the time we just need to find the right one and we may get it wrong a bunch of times and that's okay. If we don't have the right reflection, the child will let us know and that's okay. So, you know, one of the exercises we do is this idea of I can't do this. It's too hard. And normally what we would do is we would have uh, people break up into groups and then we would have them go through this and we would do, um, denying of feelings versus reflective statements and feeling how it's different. Obviously, we don't have enough time to do that today. So I'm just going to kind of keep going. So why are we avoiding questions? We kind of talked about this earlier. So questions are thought out in the head. And when we make it a statement, it actually becomes a gift to which the child may say yes, no, maybe or not answer. The statement allows the child to feel safe to respond and not worry what is the desired correct response. So it's very interesting, but when we ask a human being a question, we're actually affecting the fight or flight mechanism in their brain. And so where this affects as a child, a bunch of different things happen. They feel like there is now a performance to be done. They feel like there is a right or wrong answer. They want their answer to please. Um, and, um, and they want to feel safe. So what will happen is a child will either give you the answer they think you want, or they will completely shut down, or they will run away because we're literally affecting that fight or flight mechanism, right? We're automatically putting the child in a state of defensiveness, right? This happens with adults too. So reflective words, reflective statements work really well with adults as well. By making it a statement, we're actually speaking to an entirely different part of the brain. We're just making an observation. The person can respond, not respond, stop what they're doing, comment, tell you that they agree or disagree. There's nothing else attached to it because we're actually affecting a different part of the brain. So an example of this would be, it seems like you are angry or it seems like you're upset or it seems like you're excited rather than why are you angry? <clears throat> because if you ask the person, why are you angry? Especially a child, what do you think that answer is gonna be? I don't know, because they don't. They don't know why they're angry. That's why they're seeing you. So it's not even worth it to ask that question. But we can talk about it seems like you're angry, and they'll probably nod their head yes. So a lot of the time when you hit the right reflection, especially in a play therapy session, the child will stop. They will either stop what they're doing. 
they will stop talking, they will stop acting out because you hit the right thing. And they may not respond, but you'll see them stop dead in their tracks. And that means you hit on something that was valuable to them, all right? So what are some other ways that we're doing reflective listening? Well, part of it is this the technique called tracking, okay? And tracking basically sends the message to the child that I am paying attention to you and you don't have to do anything at all to get my attention, okay? It communicates that I am watching, listening, and paying attention. I'm responding to observable events in the child's play through verbal and body language without labeling. So you're putting that over there. You're putting that on top of that. You're building that up high, right? I'm not labeling anything. I'm just saying you're doing this, you're doing that. I'm letting the child know that I'm there with them and I'm paying attention to them. So how does that work, right, when we're doing this? Well, part of that tracking is we're looking for content, right? What is the child's story? What is the story that they're telling through their play? And we're responding by repeating some of the child's own words while commenting on observable events. So the child may say, I'm putting the dog in the house. Oh, you're putting the dog in the house. OK, you're just coming right back. Why? I'm listening to you. I'm paying attention to you. What you're saying is important. We're acknowledging feelings. We're making a tentative statement about the feelings that you believe the play is showing. Either in the metaphor, that cat seems scared right? Or directly to the child. That seems scary. A lot of the time, it's a good idea to stay within the metaphor for the child, okay? The child can talk about the soldier being scared, but they can't talk about themselves being scared. They can talk about the situation being uncomfortable for their character, their action figure, but they can't necessarily relate it to themselves. It's too emotionally charged, right? It's almost like when we have dreams, right? We have these crazy dreams that don't make sense, because our brain is creating a metaphor to push past highly emotional things that we have trouble dealing with in our conscious mind. Play therapy isn't that much different. I'm, as the child, I'm creating a metaphor that I can deal with because the reality of whatever's going on is too much. So we really want to stay within that metaphor as much as we can. All right, so what are some other techniques? Encouragement, and this is really big, and I do a, an entire training on encouragement versus praise. So I'm gonna give you like a little, a little bit of it today. So encouragement provides a way for the adult to assist the child in developing a strong sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Encouragement consists of concrete and specific messages that focus on what the child can do. I'm gonna say that again, because this is super important. Encouragement consists of concrete and specific messages that focus on what the child can do. So we're creating a situation where the child can say to him or herself, I can do it. It's like the little engine that could. So how, what does encouragement do? It provides a way for the adult to assist the child in developing a strong sense of self-worth and self-esteem. It consists, again, of concrete and specific messages that focus on what the child can do. It teaches children to appreciate their own qualities, to feel capable, and to feel worthwhile just the way they are. They learn to cooperate with others. They learn to be accepted. They learn to think for themselves. They say, I can. They become self-motivated. Their inner locus of control is now beginning to be developed. And again, encouragement is about the child, you, and praise tends to be about the adult, I. Okay, good job is about how I feel about you. You were able to figure that out is about the child. So here are some examples of uh, encouragement versus praise, right? Encouragement says, I can. You were able to do that. You figured that out. You worked hard on your painting. You are able to do hard puzzles, right? Praise says you need my approval. I am so proud of you. You were such a good boy. I like your picture. What a good job. Now, one of the things that I run into a lot when I try and go over encouragement versus praise is that people have this tendency that there's always a good box and a bad box. So if I put something in the good box then the other thing is in the bad box, right? So when I'm going over this, I don't want anyone to think that praise is a bad thing, okay? There's nothing wrong with praise, okay? It's not bad, it's encouragement is better. And I really want you to try and see it in those terms. There's nothing wrong with saying to somebody, good job. 
but you can follow up good job with what did they do concrete and specifically that made it a good job that was about what the child can do. So these things can be interwoven together. All right. So again, praise is not bad. Encouragement is better. Okay. All right. So, um, so we talked a little bit about reflecting feelings. We talked about structure. We talked about encouragement versus praise, right? And this is a lot of stuff that we're trying to get through in a very short amount of time. I'm just kind of trying to give everyone some basic techniques. Part of what we're trying to do as well is when we start getting into this mode where we're reflecting and we're tracking and we're not asking questions, all of a sudden it creates a different relationship between you and the child. Well, that can be uncomfortable for the child. And what happens is the child is probably going to start asking you questions. Why? Because most children learn at a very early age, the way to interact with an adult is through questions. Adult asks me a question, I ask adult a question. There's not a lot of interactions that don't have those things. So now all of a sudden I'm interacting with a child and I'm not asking any questions. Well, I feel a little uncomfortable with that. That's never happened before. This is something new. So I'm going to do what I've always learned which is I'm gonna ask you a question because that's how I've learned to interact. So what happens is when a child asks a question, we're just very lovingly and acceptingly gonna return responsibility back to the child, right? So I've had, I can't tell you how many times I've had a kid come into my playroom and, and they grab like a little lion, a figure of a lion and say, what's this? And I say, you're wondering what that is. You can decide what that is. And they go, it's a tiger. And then they grab another animal and they say, what's this? And I say, you're really wondering what that is. You can decide what that is too. It's a zebra. And what's funny is they know what everything is, but this is how they've learned to interact. And so all of a sudden, when you create the situation where they're now in control and you're creating a different interaction, a different relationship. So again, so what we're doing, we're supporting the child and finding their own answers. If that child turns around and says, it's a monkey, I don't care in that session. Okay, that's a monkey. Let's play with it as a monkey. They could be testing me to see, am I going to correct them? They could just want to pretend it's a monkey. It's okay. We're accepting the child where they are. We're helping them with decision making. We're acknowledging that the feeling that is motivating the question. When is this going to be over? You're thinking about something that you have to do after this. I don't, um, how much time is left? There's somewhere else that you may want to be, okay? If the question is repeated, then respond with a comment. In here, that can be whatever you want it to be. In here, you get to decide. In here, you get to make all of the decisions. To a lot of kids, that feels really good. They don't believe you at first, but that feels really good. I get to make all the decisions? Really? How does that work? Let's figure that out. So again, what are some more techniques of reflective listening? We're going to go back to this. We're working on enlarging the meaning. So we're taking the reflection to the next step. We're connecting the play behaviors to the child's life. We're helping to change some of the child's self-talk. We're identifying thoughts and expectations that influence the behavior. We're allowing the child to find alternative behaviors to meet their needs. We're acknowledging the feeling or respond to the bigger picture that the child is struggling to deal with. Sometimes nothing goes right, even when you work hard, right? Um, and in this battle, nobody wins. Everybody dies. I've had kids do that all the time where they, you know, they, they set up all of the, 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 um, the soldiers all over the playroom floor and they spend almost the whole time setting up this great battle scene. And in five minutes, everything's destroyed. Interestingly enough, this is the same kid whose parents are having a custody battle over him and they're fighting with lawyers every day, right? And it's really hard to explain to another therapeutic professional sometimes why this is valuable work for a child. And so a lot of the time we're advocating this work because there's no way the child could express that verbally, but they can play it out on the floor and it says so much and it gives them that forum to work through it. So, okay, so this is kind of like all the... PowerPoint that I had prepared for today, unfortunately, um, but there's a couple of other techniques that I want to get into. So we've talked about reflective listening, right? Now, Gary Landreth is one of my favorite people, and he created what's called the ACT model. 
of doing limit setting because we are going to have to do some limit setting in play therapy. So ACT stands for acknowledge the feeling, which we've been talking about, communicate the limit, and then target a success, um, an acceptable alternative, right? So let's take an example for a minute. Um, you have Johnny going down the slide, right? You're out on the playground and little Johnny goes down the slide head first. And the reflection is, it's really fun to do that. Uh, but it's not safe to go down the slide head first. That's the limit. Well, now we're going to communicate an acceptable alternative. You can go down the slide feet first. It's really that simple. Okay. What happens is for most children, their parents say, don't do that. Right. And then they can't understand why the child continues to do it. And then they call me and they say, my child doesn't listen to me. <clears throat> That's not actually true. What happens is we are not giving the child an acceptable alternative to work through the feeling. So they're just doing the best thing that they came up with. So part of our job, particularly as therapists, is to give them the acceptable alternative, to work with parents on finding acceptable alternatives. More often than not, when you give a child a more acceptable way to work through the feeling, they will take it every time, okay? The biggest problem is that that's not being offered to them enough and then we're having trouble with them acting out because this is the best thing they've come up with. So this is another thing that can be very difficult to communicate to parents sometimes. So again, um, you know, we have, you know, little Johnny comes over and kicks me in the shins. That's definitely happened before. You're feeling really angry. You're feeling really frustrated. People aren't for hurting. So it's a very generalized limit, right? I'm not saying I am not for kicking. People are not for hurting. Why? because we want to set a limit that wherever the child is, this is the limit. People are not for hurting. Furniture isn't for jumping on and in whatever other thing that you want to throw in there. Okay. You can say, I'm angry. You can go kick the stuffed gorilla over here, right? I always have a big stuffed animal in every playroom. Why? Because in that moment, this child has already decided to, to hit or kick so the best thing I can do is give them an, a, an acceptable alternative that they can hit or kick. They're not at a place yet where they can just use their arms to hug or say, I'm angry. There are steps that have to go in between that. So if I can redirect the child in that moment to hit the gorilla or kick by stuffed gorilla, great. I've got it off of me. They understand the limit. People aren't for hurting and they're able to do something else to work through that feeling. Over time, okay, this is probably working with a child for six months to a year, you will eventually see them shift. And one day they'll raise their arm to hit that gorilla and they'll turn around and they'll say, I'm angry. But they have to work through that process on their own. But that's the goal, right? If we can take a child who's angry and hurting other people and bring them through to a place by doing this limit setting where they're able to verbalize that feeling instead, we've accomplished a significant amount. But in order to do that, we have to stay and continue to work with where that child is, okay? So again, we're using this ACT model. We're acknowledging the feeling, we're communicating the limit, and we're targeting an acceptable alternative, okay? This is where a lot of the time we have to be creative as therapists. We're gonna have parents who come to us with a problem and they're gonna say, what's the acceptable alternative here? And our job is to problem solve with that parent. What do you think would be a more acceptable way for him to work through that feeling? What do you think the feeling is? Where do you think that feeling is coming from? Um, I just had a, a call the other day that I took where the parent was saying that the child is attacking her and physically hitting her. And as we started talking, the child had some language delays. Um, and she, And as it turned out, and this goes back to Adlerian play therapy, which is a different theory, but it's applicable here, that she was having significant feelings of inferiority. She felt like she was no good. And when she was feeling that way, her job in that moment was to make everybody else feel that way too. And that's where the angry behavior was coming from. So we, after speaking with mom, we focused on this whole strength-based approach for how we were gonna work with the child, focus on her strengths, focus on what she's good at, focusing on encouragement, because once she starts feeling better about herself, her need to attack or hurt others um, will diminish. Why? 
I feel so bad about me that I want to push everyone else away. I don't deserve to be loved. So I'm going to push everyone else away, especially the people who love me the most. It sounds counterintuitive. Children do it all the time. And so if we automatically put that child into the bad box or say they have ADHD and we have to put them on medication, we miss the whole thing that those kids really need to be loved more. They need to be told that even when you make a mistake, even when you get it wrong, I still love you. Even when it's not quite right and you're not feeling good about yourself, I still love you. And so a lot of these messages can get miss missed a lot. And this is where, again, we come in as a therapist. This is where play therapy benefits the child because it's the super accepting space where we're giving the child what they need. So that's that limit setting model. And again, it's called ACT. I'm gonna go over it one more time. We're acknowledging the feeling, we're communicating the limit, we're targeting an acceptable alternative, okay? Nine times out of 10, you, you'll just reflect the feeling and you'll see the child's behavior shift. The rest of the time you have to set the limit. Now, what if you do all that and it still doesn't work, right? Now, what do I do? These are all the techniques you taught me, Eric. I don't understand. Well. That's when we start to get into choices. And this is what we're going to end with. We got about five minutes left. So, and choices basically are about teaching the child responsibility. Okay. We're creating a situation where the child makes the choice. I am completely and totally unemotionally involved in the situation. It doesn't matter to me one way or the other, what choice the child makes. The only thing that matters is the child feeling the consequence of that choice. It is not a good or a bad choice. It is simply the natural consequence of the choice that they have made. Okay, so I'm going to kind of explain this. So we go back to little Johnny on the slide, right? So I tell little Johnny, oh, Johnny, it's fun to go down the slide head first, uh, but it's not safe to do in school or it's not safe, period. You can go down the slide feet first. Little Johnny ignores you because you've never set a limit for him before. So he goes down the slide again and he goes down head first. And you set the limit again. And he ignores you again. He does it the third time. Okay, Johnny, if you choose to go down the slide head first, you choose not to use the slide anymore today. If you choose to go down the slide feet first, you choose to continue using the slide. So in that sentence, I use the word choose four times. Why did I do that? I want the child to know that something is about to change. I want the child to hear the word choose. I want the child to know that they are about to make a choice that is going to affect them one way or another. So now I've never done this with little Johnny before. So what do you think little Johnny's gonna do? He's gonna go down the slide feet head first. Of course he is. Now I'm gonna say, okay, little Johnny, you have chosen not to use the slide anymore today. I'm gonna go right back to targeting another alternative. You can use all the other stuff on the playground but you've chosen not to use the slide anymore today. Now, what's little Johnny going to do now? He's going to try and go use the slide again, right? And this is where you're going to get into your limit setting all over again. You may have to stand in front of the ladder. I know you'd really like to do that, or you would really like to do that. You're acknowledging the feeling. You're setting the limit. You have chosen not to use the slide anymore today. You can, again, target the acceptable alternative. You can use all the other equipment on the playground. Now, at this point, what is little Johnny probably going to do? He's probably going to throw himself on the floor and have a tantrum. That's okay. All right. You can get down on the floor and you can rub his back and you can be loving and accepting. And in a, in a very loving and accepting way, you can say in an empathic way, you could say you're really unhappy about the choice that you made. That made you feel very sad. Tomorrow, you can make a different choice to try again. Is there somewhere, and then you can direct the child to find something else to play with. So again, I'm acknowledging the feelings. I'm not giving into the wants, needs, or wishes. I'm staying consistent with my limit setting. I've given choices. I've made it very clear to the child that they have made the choice. I am not scolding them or taking responsibility or shaming them for the choice that they made. I'm just letting them feel the consequence of their choice. This is where all of this becomes very therapeutic for the child. They don't feel judged. They don't feel shamed. They feel heard and understood. And they also recognize that they have the opportunity to make a different choice next time and do it differently.
This does so many different things. It gets the child thinking ahead to the future. It gets them problem solving on how to do things differently. It helps them take responsibility for their actions. Okay, so those are all, so I covered it all in an hour. I'm gonna take a deep breath here. Um, and those are all the basic tenets of how we do child-centered play therapy and working with kids. So it is exactly 1.15. Uh, so technically this training is over. I am going to stay on and answer any questions that anybody has. Uh, let me see if I can adjust my screen so I can see everybody. Let me see if I can, oh, I gotta stop sharing my screen. That's what I have to do. There we go. Okay, so does anybody have any questions for me about any of this or is there anything I can answer? No, everybody's got it. Everybody's going to go out in the world and be great play therapists starting tomorrow. That's amazing. I'm so excited. Okay, then. Well, um, so what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to reintroduce myself. My name is Eric Munt. Someone has a question. Oh, Eric. someone has a question. Go ahead. Karen. Hi. So hi, I'm, Karen. Hi. I am interning at a, um, a nonprofit private Nonprofit private practice. <laughs> uh, we have one room that has Sandra and toys and stuff, but it is definitely, this is, it's a center that mostly sees adults. So we have limited resources for kids and I don't always get an opportunity to reserve the room that has the toys. So is there, like if I were to gather together <laughs> some things that are mine that I can take around in a suitcase or something. Mm -hmm. Is there a collection of items that you, I mean, some of our rooms have battleship and I will play battleship because that's what's in the room and that's what the kids want to play with. Um, and you know, we learn what we can through, <laughs> through battleship. Sure. Um, so yeah, is there, is there some in the absence of being in a center that is really designed for children? Cause I've seen what that looks like and it's incredible. What can I, what, what would you recommend putting together? Yeah, sure. That's great. So yes, what you're asking about is how do I create a traveling toy kit? Yeah. Right. And so, yes. So what we have is we get those plastic bins that are about yay big with the lid and um, you know, what are they Rubbermaid bins or they're small, right? Um, the small plastic bins and, um, and we fill those with different things, right? So you're going to want animals. You're going to want wild animals and, and domestic animals, right? And, and, you know, about yay big, right? They don't have to be huge. Like the um, ones that come in the tubes? Those are great. Yeah, those tubes are fine. Absolutely. So you can get sea animals. You can get um, dinosaurs. You can get uh, snakes. Snakes, believe it or not, are super important. Snakes and bugs. Um uh, domestic animals and wild animals, jungle animals. Some of the ones that are great is there's a couple, like it's a monkey with a baby on its back. Those are great. Um, it's a nice idea if you can to have two sizes of each type of animal, because they do a lot of play with mama and baby or dad and baby. So that's something that you can try and create. All right. So animals are first, right? Um, Oh, Debbie's just thanking everyone for completing the training today. I wish I had known this before I got rid of all my kids' toys. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, and I, I got a guy, I'll give you my phone number. I have a guy who's in Boynton that he basically buys and sells used toys. And so I've created my entire play kit from just, I told him what I needed and he found a bunch of stuff for me. And I got like an entire kit for like 50 bucks of everything I needed. Wow. So you can also go to like play therapy supply and uh, they have, you can just buy a kit and it's got pretty much everything you need. Um, so you can do that as well. Playtherapysupply.com and, and there's another one. But so you want animals, you want action figures, right? Superheroes. You want um, what look like family members, right? Children, adults, uh, different members of society, whatever that is, you know, police officers, right? You want vehicles. You want to make sure you definitely have a police car and an ambulance in there somewhere. Okay. If you can find an ambulance where the back of it opens up and you can put stuff inside, that's the best. All right. But again, you don't really want something bigger than this because you don't want to be lugging a whole bunch of stuff around. But so ambulance, police car, fire truck, those are all super important because kids will play out themes of rescuing. Um, you can have some things like um, like small rocks and small fences and 
anything where the child could basically build a world in the sandbox. Okay. Um, what are some other things? You can have one thing that it's got a pretend cell phone. It's got handcuffs. Okay. That's a big one. Handcuffs. You can't, I can't tell you how many kids have handcuffed me and thrown me in jail. That one comes up a lot. So having handcuffs, make sure you get the ones that if you lose the key, you can still open them though. Cause otherwise mm -hmm. it's bad. Mm -hmm. I've had that happen before too. So that's not good. Um, so cell phone, uh, maybe some musical stuff, potentially not something that they're going to put in their mouth, but something that they could potentially play music. Um, a badge, right? Like a, like a little police badge. That's always good. Cause they're going to want to be the sheriff. Uh, if you can fit some dress up stuff, great. It's not necessary, but like the badge is really good. Um, sunglasses, right. Or a good thing to have in that little box. So just little accessories and stuff like that, that if, if a kid was pretending to be their parent and playing stuff out that they've seen an adult do, these are some things that they would have at their disposal. Um, let's see, what are a couple other things? So I said animals, I'm just trying to think about what other stuff is in my play, a doctor's kit. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Okay. You can usually get a plastic doctor kit about this big. That's got some good stuff inside. Um, sometimes a toolbox. That's actually a good one too. If you can get a little play toolbox and then you can get a bigger container that you can actually make into a sandbox if you want or not. And you can get a little cart, you know, those little folding carts with the bungees. And that's typically what I carry it on. If you make a traveling sandbox, don't put that one on the bottom put the other containers on first because the minute you go off a bump, it's going to crack the bottom and you're not going to notice until you take it out of your car that there's sand all over your car. So don't put it on the bottom, but you know, hold on one second real quick. But so this is, this is about the size. Let me see if I can back up. This is about the size of a, of a sandbox that I would make. This is like $7, right? So we and, have it. We have the, in the one room, we have one that's that size. Great. And so basically, if you can find one with a blue lid, that's better. And because you're going to put the lid underneath. And so when the kid moves the sand away, it looks like water. That works really well. Um, and also with the sand inside, you can put at least two smaller boxes inside of the sandbox. So the more you can kind of consolidate everything when you're moving in and out, the easier it is to travel with. But so, yeah, I had a traveling toy kit for years that I brought it everywhere. I worked at a private practice and they had nothing. And so I just brought my own stuff and set it up in whatever office I got to use that day. If you're going to do traveling sand, um, I also recommend that you bring a big beach towel and you put the beach towel under the sandbox because stuff is sand is going to get out. And at the end, all you do is pick up the beach towel and shake it back into the sandbox and you're done. Oh, that's so much better. I vacuum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll ruin the vacuum and you'll end up running out of sand. So I try to reuse it as much as possible. So those are the basic things. Um, and I'm always looking for things that are just interesting, interesting looking, uh, especially with figures and action figures, but you always want to have a Superman. You always want to have a Batman. You always want to have Spider-Man. Um, sometimes the Hulk is really good. A lot of kids, especially kids who are angry, they pick the Hulk. I'm always interested in seeing what superhero a kid's going to grab. Um, there's a lot of more. There's a lot more female superheroes out there now. So I definitely try and go 50-50 with my superheroes. I try and find as many female superheroes as I can, um, so that the girls have access to that as well. Um, you can try and do dolls. I would try and do small dolls. We had like. Um, one box that was just like Polly Pockets. Have you ever seen those? So you can like take the clothes and they're like rubber. So a lot of the girls really like to play with those because they like to change the outfits. So that you can do. Um, I wouldn't spend a ton of time tracking that down, but that's something that you can have. Um, a baby doll in a crib is always good. Not necessarily something you can travel with. But because there's a lot of kids who go through stuff where there's a new baby in the family and they're struggling. So they're holding the baby doll. There's a lot of stuff they play out with the baby doll. So those are my recommendations. Um, I always recommend if you can find or buy used toys and just clean them, do that because they're going to get beat up anyway. There's no point in spending a lot of money on new stuff if you can't. 
Um, and if you have friends who are looking to get rid of toys, that's the other thing. I can't tell you how many clients I have that call me and say, hey, do you need toys? We're going to throw a bunch of stuff away. Do you want to look through it and pick out what you want? And I say, yeah. And, and so I'll, they'll bring me a whole thing. And they say, just donate or throw away whatever you don't use. So that works. So you can create kind of this system where people just start bringing you stuff regularly. And you okay. don't really have to buy anything. All right. Do you ever play games? Like we have the talking, feeling, doing game. And I have one client who's is very bright eight-year-old who loves to play that game. And he always okay. asks for it. So that's okay. a very different kind of play because it's a board game. Sure. And it's much more directive. Sure. Yeah. Do, is, is that against like the type of play therapy you do or? No, there is nothing against the type okay. of play therapy I do. You know, there are different seminal theories, right? So if we're talking specifically about client-centered, client-centered would not have games particularly, right? Uh, or it would have something like Connect Four, right? Where there's not anything, you're interacting, but you're not necessarily creating a direction with rules, okay? To be honest with you though, when you're doing therapy, the goal is to do whatever works. So if you're connecting with the child through that game, I would say that's great. Keep doing that. Okay. It's it's just about connecting with the child and finding what works. That's what's most important every time. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Does anyone else Sorry. have any other questions? I know someone had a question about making the PowerPoint available. I'm not sure okay. if you wanted to do. Yes, I will email it to you, Sophia. And then if you can get it out to everybody, that okay. would be great. Yeah, we mm -hmm. can do that. Yep. Thanks. Is that, was that Helen? Was that your question? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. No, actually. Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I work with a lot of teens that seems to be in, especially in the pandemic, kind of have a little, limited way of playing. And a lot of them through the online connections, uh, some of that parents approved, they do cosplay. And that seems to be their world. Uh, you know, it's either that or computer games. So um, would you... Would you think, would you say some of these play theory could be applied to cosplay for teens? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I listen, it, I dress up when I go to Comic-Con. So yes. Um, yes. And I still go to Comic-Con. I'm a big geek. So absolutely. That's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah so I always want to know, you know, like, why did they pick that character? Why are they attracted to that character? What are the qualities that that character has that they mm -hmm. enjoy? I really want to understand why they're connecting to that character that they want to dress up as. Because basically with that cosplay, yes, they want to take pictures and post them on the internet, but they're also becoming that character. And I want to know what that character means to them and how it's different than how they see themselves. Um, and I find that that can give you a lot of insight into where they are. So it's not necessary for me to know any of the animes they watch. I don't need to know. I just, just need to know what it means to them. That's it. Yeah. And if you want to start watching, you can. I remember this was years ago, but I had these three brothers that came to the playroom and they always had Doctor Who t-shirts on and they always, everything was Doctor Who. And I'm like, I got to watch this show so I can understand. And I watched like six seasons of it. I couldn't stop watching it. So, and I got way into it. So it's, I mean, it's, yeah, you, you, you take it as far as you want to go Okay. with how much you want to learn. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. welcome. Does anyone else have any questions? I, I know we still have some people on. Colleen, Samaya, Karen. No? I have a question. This okay. is Samaya. Um, in the example that you gave earlier um, about ACT, mm -hmm. uh, with the kid going down the slide head first, mm -hmm. um, in the event that, let's say he goes down head first, you give him the limit, and he continues to defy you and he's like I'm going down I don't care what you say how do you address that um right so that's I so guess that's when you the act. yeah so that's when you get back into this the choices right where you say okay if you choose to go down the slide head first you choose not to use the slide anymore today he goes down the slide head first you say okay You've chosen not to use the slide anymore today. Now, you may have to physically stand in front of the ladder. You may have to physically remove him every time he tries to yeah. get back on the slide. And you're just going to keep repeating yourself that I know you'd really like to do that, but you chose not to use the slide anymore today. You can use anything else on the playground. 
but you've chosen not to use the slide anymore today. And it's just, you're going to be a broken record. You're just going to keep repeating that message over and over and over. And at some point he's going to run away. And then the minute you're not paying attention, he's going to try and come back to see how consistent you are. So, and that's fine. And, and why is he testing you? He's testing you because he wants to see how consistent you're going to be because there probably is no consistency in his life. And there probably are no limits yeah. in his life and there probably are no boundaries in his life. So he's asking you to give that to him because it's going to make him feel safe, right? Limit setting is always directly related to safety. When I do the same thing over and over and over again, and your response is exactly the same and you don't yell and you don't scream and you don't hit me, I feel safe. And that's what I need. And so the child is communicating to you. I don't feel safe right now. All right. So yeah. it's a lot easier to manage those behaviors when you can have this little man that kind of, or woman that sits in the back of your head and says over and over, it's not about you mm -hmm. um, and, and says they don't feel safe, help them feel safe. And so I train myself to kind of have that message cycling in the background. It's not about you. They need to feel safe, help them feel safe. And so when you get into that mode and when you can view the child through that lens, it really helps you stay calm and help them. Yeah, no, thank you. That definitely makes sense. I like the clarification that you are able to do something physically. Like, yeah, you can yeah, move them, you can block. Okay. All right, perfect. Yeah, you thank just have you. to, you know, you just have to do it safely where you're not harming mm -hmm. yourself or the child, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yes, Helen. Thank you. To, to tag what Samaya just said, I was wondering, would you ever consider using the magic one, two, three? Yeah, magic one, can two, three is great. Yeah, I got no problem. Okay. That's, that's great. That's that been works. I have that. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Thank you. No, I gotta absolutely. go. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Bye, Is everybody. Is there a way we can stay in touch with you by email? Yeah. Once. You <laughs> yeah. Um. So, Sophia, if you want to send my email, can you send my email out to everybody that if they want yes, to get in touch? I will. Great. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. Yeah. Great. Sophia, yeah, we're gonna you. try and do this again. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Okay. Bye, Helen. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay. Bye.